This is Carl Ackerman, host of History is Here to Help, and I am so pleased that Colin Baker has taken the time um, to join us all the way from Virginia, and um, he is working now for the European Union and uh, working and helping to define the European Union um, for schools. And um, uh, Colin, uh, thank you very much for joining us, and I'm going to begin with your first question, and that is, can you define the European Union for us? You know, expecting that many Americans know what it is, but uh, there may be some who do not. Right. Well, good morning, Carl. I know it's a different time zone where you are. Yeah, so the European Union is, is just a relatively recent, the last couple of decades name. It had various names after World War II. But essentially, it's a collection of, of uh, sovereign nations who have pooled their sovereignty and their resources and started off as an energy club, and it's developed into so much more. Um, it's got 27 members, started off with six, um, so it's expanded since the 1950s, and today is one of the largest economic groupings in the world, but its, it's influence and power goes beyond economics. It's very important for liberal democracy today. Well, Colin, uh, th that's a great definition, and I want to um, sort of ask you, because I know you're a historian, um, that you were are, you are trying to really explicate the European Union in in the school systems, you know, um, not only um, in Virginia, but across the country. So I, I'd like you to tell, sort of characterize your work and um, what brought you to this work. And of course, I know that you have yeah. both Scottish and um, American citizenships, uh, probably right mm -hmm. now UK citizenship and, and, and United States citizenship. So yeah. um, how does that all work? And you might tell us a bit about yourself um, in answering this question. Yeah, I used to have uh, EU citizenship as well until Brexit. So I was that was stripped for me a couple of years ago. That's interesting. That's another issue. Um, yeah, I work for a Jean Monnet Center. So Jean Monnet is one of the three people behind me. He's actually the one right behind my head. This is our conference room at Virginia Tech for our European Union Center. And it's funded by Jean Monnet funding from the European Union. And Jean Monnet himself was one of the founders of the EU but one of the education programs linked to the EU um, is named after him. So we get a grant from the EU, Virginia Tech, it's a grant from the EU to establish one of these centers of excellence. There's 11 in the United States. There's not one in Hawaii, but there's certainly several, uh, uh, there have been several, there's at least one left in California. Um, and his job really is to be a centers, as the name implies, of excellence, but spreading um, knowledge uh, about what the EU does, about its importance, uh, about modern European studies. It's not just EU focused. Uh, our centre in particular is, has a big, long, complicated name, but um, it's Europe as a whole and, and Europe's near abroad too. So maybe we'll get a chance to talk about Russia or the Middle East or North Africa. Um, and of course, it involves NATO too. One of the two flags behind me is a NATO flag. So we do work with NATO, we have security experts as well. Um, but essentially, the Jean Monnet Centre has three legs to, to its uh, kind of stool of, of uh, work that it's supposed to do in return for getting a grant in the EU. One is uh, research, so we have visiting professors in there, like I'm saying, security and economy and trade and all sorts of um, identity and culture and language, different parts of the EU. And then we have um, masters and uh, undergrad courses, uh, minors and majors in European studies. But the third leg is where I come in is outreach. So it's not just a university and stays at uh, academic level. They have outreach to the broader community, particularly down one level to high school uh, level, teachers especially, but also to students. And that's where my involvement came through my work with the. Uh, uh, AP European history across the country. And so I happened to be living here in the town and they sent the center up and I had already known the professor here and worked with him, who's the director. And he asked me to be involved. So I've been doing this for three years now. Now, <clears throat> sort of a large question here. Um, why does this matter? I mean, why, why do you think the European Union um, is important? Of course, you know, following politics, you know, in the news today um, with Ukraine, of course, People are well aware of what's happening in Europe, um, especially in Eastern Europe. But, you know, why do you think that this is important for Americans to know about? Uh, 
especially high school kids, um, about the European Union? So it's important, the boring answer and the most important and really the reason the EU started in one sense it was for trade, right? And in a, a, a place like Hawaii, where you import most of your products, right? Trade is a big issue. So promoting global free trade and having a trade union that can attract um, uh, being a big enough trading block, it has a lot of influence on um, all sorts of things connected to world trade patents and standards. And, um, and of course, it can influence through uh, kind of soft power, I guess. Uh, countries who are wanting to join the EU uh, have to adopt so many of the EU values. Um, we're talking democratic values. They want to get in for the trade benefits, but the EU is going to attract them to become like liberal democracies. So trade is definitely connected to um, democracy as well, right? So uh, Eastern European countries joined the EU after the fall of the Soviet Union, and they, they actively tried to reform their societies uh, so that the EU would accept them as, as members, uh, and they would benefit as they have dramatically in the last 20, 30 years. Poland is a great example of that for a good, a good example. So if we're interested in world um, trade and we're interested in liberal democracy around the world and uh, values uh, that we all share here in the United States, then Europe and the EU is a natural partner in that. And that's something the EU promotes a lot, the, free, the four freedoms, one of which definitely is economic, but um, freedom to trade, but it's also uh, um, freedom to move, freedom to speak freely. Um, and it's the things that we take for granted here in our democracy, the EU's also promoting the same thing. So it's like a natural partner with the United States in so many areas. And then you could get into security as well. That's a whole different thing with NATO, but um, that would be my first answer. Yeah, it, it's, it's a place, a continent that has a lot of power and influence and is a, a, a natural ally to what the United States is trying to do around the world as well. Do you think, uh, Colin, that your <clears throat> your work in educating the youth of um, of America, um, you know, with eleven centers, um, is it directly influenced? Do you think by your Scottish background? I mean, do you think that you present a <clears throat> particular point of view? I mean, not one, but many um, that would be probably not as um, diverse in the in the real sense of that term, meaning. You know, uh, you know, having different tangents. Um, mm -hmm. uh, had you had you been an American in that same position? Well, it's interesting that there's definitely a, an element of identity uh, in the EU, and you can be European but also be British, uh, or at least you used to be, uh, and also be Scottish. Just like you can be Spanish and from Catalonia, and are these competing identities or are they overlapping? You know. And that, that's not just a European phenomenon. It's the same in the United States, right? And in many other parts of the world. So it's an interesting um, dynamic to, to make students aware of that there are parallels to uh, uh, dynamics going on in Europe, populism, um, the whole idea of immigrants coming to your country. Like this is a, definitely a theme here in the United States. Uh, they're not quite the same as you. How do you integrate them into your society? Should they share your values or can they live um, separate existences? Can you be uh, have a dual national and uh, identity? And is that something that um, we value or not? Right. And that's one reason Britain left the EU. It definitely didn't want to accept as many immigrants as the EU uh, because of free movement of people. Uh, was allowing, but now Britain controls its borders. But but then there's downsides to that. Um, businesses have suffered, and so I guess my own personal background is I thought it was a gigantic mistake to have Brexit, and I'm I'm not apologising for saying that. Um, but uh, this is some people have said, why do you do this? And I say jokingly, it's my best revenge on Brexit, right? To work against the forces of populism. Um, and promote uh, the European Union in the United States. But um, 
I think there are so many other reasons to want to, to know about the EU and for our students. I could get into some of the programs that we run uh, where they take on the role of EU countries and they debate with each other and we, they prepare. And so it's, I'm not just, a, although the centre in one sense acts like an ambassador for the EU, it, it does so many other things, right? And it connects students to wider issues that are really useful uh, for when they go to college. Well, you know, I'm going to I'm going to press you on that and what you just said. And so, um, as you know, for years, I've worked at uh, a school, a large private um, independent school, the largest private school in terms of population in the country at Puno. Mm -hmm. So I, I announced to my students that we're going to have this gentleman by the name of Colin Baker come into our school and um, discuss the EU. So what would you do? I mean, what would what would be the, you know, the core curriculum and um and um, how would you handle all of this? Because, I mean, the EU in itself, you know, I mean, we, we, you know, going back to the coal and steel community, I mean, it's many years and many facets. And so I just want to know how specifically you do this, Colin. So, in, as you know, because you taught this for many years, and AP European history is part of the curriculum. Like in many um, elective courses, you're going to that deal with world or European issues at high school. You're going to have some part of uh, modern Europe, like post World War II. I'm talking about um, that's in the curriculum. But even if your course is not uh, doesn't specifically cover the EU, or if you're not even taking a history course, like for example, we have this um, the EU Council debate each March. We've done it for the past five years, and we invite students regionally from around this area. But we're trying to expand now to different parts of Virginia. This is the sort of thing that could be done in our schools and in Hawaii too, um, where students take a role of one of the 27 EU member states, countries. And if you have more than 27 students, you can have two or three or more in a group, right? We've had uh, 120 um, the last few years, students involved in five or six high schools. And they actively uh, research their country's position on two or three pressing, like current issues in the EU. And often we try to um, make the issues so that they're transactional, so that you can take a position in one area and not be so firm in another, and then you can negotiate, right? With you're trying to reach consensus with 27 members, the EU has to act together, right? It has to reach a consensus. So can you do that? Can Poland agree with Portugal, right? Can Ireland agree with Greece, right? Um, on different issues that they might have different priorities on. So the students have this, um, not only are they researching, but they're also collaborating with other groups and it's over two or three days. They have a time to do online um, negotiating and then they meet in person and it's, it works really well. It's a joy to, to see it happen. All their hard work is, suddenly into action. Now they're the ambassador of Slovenia and they've got to meet the prime minister of Finland and can, can they agree or negotiate on one or more of their issues? And they little huddles of form around the room and, and the students report back and just how much they've learned and just how much they've enjoyed. And, and um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the projects, one of the programs that we have here for high school students. Most of our programs are actually for high school teachers, but that's one of the biggest and um, most visible events that we do. Oh, I'd love to do that. You, in Hawaii. Yes. <laughs> can, you, can you can you further explain what you mean by uh, programs for teachers and how that operates? Yeah. So um, we have a program called Transatlantic Scholars, where we pair up teachers from um, Ireland. We have three, and we pair them with three teachers in Virginia. And they collaborate throughout the year. We've been doing this for the last couple of years. Um, we kind of tweak the format a little bit each year um, that can be synchronous, but mostly asynchronous. Um, and we try and pair teachers who have similar age students and classes that can overlap to some degree. Um, so that's a, a program. And they, they collaborate not just as one on one as teachers, but their classes can collaborate on projects, and we put them up on our website at Virginia Tech. Um, for example, uh, last year, uh, one of the groups in Dublin and Ireland did a project on memorials and, and how um, 
how memorials have changed and how they're been um, some have been defaced, right? And of course, the group in Virginia with Robert E. Lee, um, Monument Avenue in Virginia, that's, that's all over the news, and they were doing the same thing. So they, then they could share with the other group uh, a similar issue, but uh, involving slightly different figures and time periods, perhaps as well. Um, so that was immensely helpful, and we um, and students love doing that. And teachers. Uh, can collaborate there, but we've also have a biannual conference. We're going to have another one in November. Last time we had uh, eight different states. I think the furthest west, we did have someone want to come from Colorado, but then didn't turn out in the end. But we had people from Chicago to Florida to New England and all over the East Coast uh, come here to Virginia Tech. And we had um, over two days, we had a big conference for 25 teachers. We even managed to do um, Scottish country dancing and Irish Irish dancing and linking that to Appalachian culture. So it had it's not just lectures on or the forums discussions on political economic events and they use culture and identity and we try and make it fun in the evening and we had a whiskey tasting as well, which is a lot of fun. It's a lot of many teachers like that. So these are some of the programs that we have and hopefully I can share my the website with you and you, teachers can discover for themselves because we have plenty of online um, events with ambassadors and other things that, that anyone's welcome to join. Well, I'm glad you emphasize the teachers with the whiskey tasting. So that's, that's just great. But do you, do you have um, the possibility of teachers to um, have exchanges and students to have exchanges um, with the EU? Um, um, you know, you, you and I both know that some of the most powerful, um, educational lessons occur when people are actually placed in the setting, um, mm -hmm. they're forced to sort of uh, deal with different cultures and in some cases, yes. different languages. Right. We're exploring that. There are some of the other EU centers, the other John Monet centers of the 11 in the United States do have, uh, programs that they teachers at least get to go to Europe. It's a lot harder to do it for students. I'm not aware of high school students who travel to Europe or do exchanges through the Jean Monnet centers, but I know that there are programs for teachers to do that. And if uh, there is a, uh, I think it's through UC Berkeley that, that would be the nearest one to Hawaii, but um, they uh, have students that go every year to Brussels. At, when I say students, they have teachers that go every year to Brussels. So um, that there is an opportunity for teachers around the United States to do that. And perhaps, if, probably if you could fly to California, then maybe they could fly, fly you there to Europe. But there might be an opportunity for teachers in Hawaii to, to do that. And I can certainly provide you with details about that program. That's not run through us, but it's run through other Jean Money centers. There's a network that we all collaborate. So, so from what you're what you're saying, all the eleven centers do have sort of a, um, a, a independent um, framework, um, somewhat. Yes. Um, if they're doing right. you know you know different things, and is does the main funding come from the the original um, uh, funding source that that's providing the money? It's also for Virginia Tech. Uh, there's different sources of funding. It depends on the different universities, and they can go, of course, have private funding too, but. The EU, most of the funding comes through the Jean Monnet centers. You, you mm -hmm. get a chair, a university professor that comes the chair, and then you can get a center of excellence, and then you can have a three-year grant. And that's what we've done over the past three years here at Virginia Tech. I'm um, just asking, um, the one that said Berkeley, is it connected with the University of California at Berkeley? I believe so, yes. Um, would it be possible, and I'm just asking because, you know, we here in Hawaii would love to have an EU center here. Um, can it <laughs> be attached to um, another center? For example, there's two centers, and I'm thinking of the Woe International Center at Punahou School, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, also, uh, at, you know, at the University of Hawaii, um, you know, with a, a variety of different centers, and then also at Ilani School with their Sullivan Center. Right, it has to be a higher ed institution. So we need to be the University of Hawaii. That's, okay. uh, there are some schools who can apply for smaller grants, but recently the EU has restricted that to just being European schools. 
that so the only institutions in the United States that could apply for EU funding or EU center money would be a university. So, but the University of Hawaii could certainly do that, um, apply for chair and then a center of excellence. Hmm? That sounds that sounds wonderful because um, we have what's called the East West Center um, that was developed in the nineteen sixties. Um, and uh, actually, interestingly enough, developed by an art professor. How that worked, uh, you know, who knows? But um, um, the East West Center was sort of a you know a counter to during the Cold War to the old Moscow oriented uh, Patrice Lumumba University. But in any case, okay. long story short, is that would probably be the opportunity. Now, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you today, which is extremely important to you and me as uh, as AP European History um, instructors, mm -hmm. um, and that is. What's the effect? What do you see as a liaison in Virginia? What do you see the impact on the kids? Um, you know, when you see these kids um, exploring the wonderful things that you were presenting them, um, how does that? How does that? You know, how does how does that affect them? What's your what's your takeaway from so from seeing what the kids are taking away? Um, um, right, this wonderful EU experience. Well, my high school and I teach high school as well. It, it, Courses in a college town. So students here are sort of exposed to some international things more than perhaps a typical high school might be. But we make it a point to reach out to the local area, and the area around here is very rural in Appalachia. So we have students, um, teachers who come to our programs uh, from as far away as North Carolina um, and the neighboring states. And, and then we have this. Um, EU debate in March, where we had students, high school students, come from a very, um, you might say, rural high school. And what we heard their teachers say, and these other teachers at our conference, is it's, it's like opening a window in a new world, right? They can go back to their students, other students who come here can see it in person, that, hey, I, I can do this. This is something I never thought, even didn't even know what the EU was before, right, until we did research on this, or my teacher presented it to me. And then we got involved in this as cool debate thing, and um, or my teacher gave me these resources from the conference, and we hear feedback that it's it's opened the eyes of students that, they, that to do something and to be aware and connected to different parts of the world um, in a way that they never were before. So that to me is really the whole ball game right there, right? You want to inspire curiosity, and um, sure, you want to prepare them for college and there's all sorts of um, other benefits and teach them to write well. Um, but when you're an educator, what you really want to do is the, have that light bulb turn on and their eyes wide open and they, hey, I didn't know I could do this, right? This was great. I, you know, they're texting their mother. I was the ambassador. I, and their mother actually spoke to me. She said, oh, so-and-so really enjoyed being the prime minister of Ireland. He, he was really turned on and now, uh, now he might Think about doing a political science degree at college. I mean, that's that's the sort of thing you want to hear from um, type of programs we offer. Well, um, I I was I was intrigued by you know the uh, by your last comment about the um, student who really was motivated by you know the the absorption of a lot of Irish culture um, in the Republic mm -hmm. of Ireland. But uh, do you see um, any kind of increase in not only interest in the culture, but perhaps development in terms of languages, because, you know, the, you know, the joke has always been, um, uh, uh, you know, what, what, um, what country is monolingual? And the answer is always the United States. Um, um, but, you know, in, in getting these kids interested in, you know, French and Spanish and Italian, mm -hmm. and Romanian and Polish, and God forbid they want to study Russian and things like this. So, um, although right. Russia is not a member of the EU, but I mean, maybe now Swedish and perhaps the most difficult language that I've ever come across outside of some of the Eastern languages, Finnish, you know, if they mm -hmm. join the, the European Union. So uh, let me just ask you that question. So you're asking how can students learn uh, world languages or is, will the EU Do they get motivated by this EU experience? It's like, you know, kids saying, oh, I was, I was. I focused on France and now I want to go and I want to be another Mitterrand and I want to go or Jacques Chirac and I want to, <laughs> I want to learn French, you know? Yeah, I, well, we do at our conferences that we run every couple of years, we do have language teachers come and, and so that would be more a question for them in a, in a, 
history setting, um, I think it's more of the diplomacy and negotiation that I see. But uh, I don't. There are students, of course, who are actually in my one of my own classes this year. I had students from um, France, and I've had students from all over different parts of Europe, uh, and he, Belgium, Luxembourg, right? And they they actually want to represent their own countries, which is Croatia is another one this year. So uh, their family, the parents were Croatian. They're like they're Croatian American, and now they get to be the ambassador for Croatia. You know, it's like a, a reawakening of their cultural roots. So, but I'm sure that can happen for any American student. They can just get interested in in a European country, and that can spark a, a desire to learn more about them. Perhaps learn a language or study about that place and um, in their political science classes. So. Yeah. So let me, you know, we only have two minutes left, so I'm going to ask you a broad question so that you can really, it's, you know, the, the ball will be in your court, as we say, and in the United States, Colin. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, um, you are a historian by training. And so my, my last question to you is, how do you think your history background um, is critical for your work here at the EU? And um, coupled with that is, why do you think that it's important for kids to learn the history of the EU? Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned that because I think the, the one of the um, most important things about the EU, sure, it's liberal values and it's um, giant energy club and trade and all that, is the fact that it's incredibly successful as a diplomatic, as a as a uh, tool to promote peace in Europe. Because when it was founded, France and Germany, as you know, had fought many wars over the previous seventy years, right? Franco Prussian World War I, World War II. But now, in the last 70 years, France and Germany are in, are in lockstep in this um, peaceful democratic club, right? So, what a transformation. The EU actually got awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for that, right? For promoting peace on the continent of Europe. That's before, of course, Putin comes along. But, but nevertheless, um, for most of the last 70 years, Europe has, has had this um, period of stability and peace and the, the large NATO is a big part of that definitely and the United States has a big role to play in that too but the EU itself and promoting um, its values and, and things we talked about um, that's why it's worth noting right it's a type it's a formula for a type of association um, that has been successful and and promoted peace and that other regions of the world could learn from definitely. Well, thank you. We're almost out of time. Thank you, Colin Baker from Virginia Tech. Um, this has been most enjoyable. And um, of course, our goal should be to establish one of these um, 11 <laughs> sites, make it 12 um, in uh, Honolulu and get you to uh, come out here to Hawaii, uh, Colin, and, and um, do your magic with the European Union. Colin Baker, thank again, you. from Virginia Tech, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.